live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is February 10th, Friday, February 10th, 2017. And boy, do we have a lot to catch up on today. Did you know the president was a complete idiot? If you didn't, you've come to the right place to find out whether or not it's the case. We have an awful lot of things to cover. Of course, today I keep saying we have a, a big backlog. And of course, things continue to pile up. The news is chock full of good articles today that are really uh, penetrating and insightful. We'll try and get through a couple of those. Armando, I don't know what's on your plate today, but of course, uh, might be a good day to dig into the Ninth Circuit's decision a little bit. But you don't even have to get that far into it. I guess really, what, here's what you need to know about the Ninth Circuit this morning. Trump doesn't really know what the hell they did, <clears throat> and he's not capable of reading the articles that explain it all the way through before commenting on it. I, I, I don't know. The least surprising thing, I guess, this morning, before I even get to the uh, housekeeping stuff, well, uh, why, don't, why don't we take care of the housekeeping first? Boy, you can wait for this, like five seconds. Daily Coast Radio is live. I don't really need to tell you that, but it's in Bill's tweet, and I read whatever I see on TV, just like the president. This is sort of like it's on a TV. It's a, it's on a glowing screen. I'll believe anything you put on a glowing screen. Daily Coast Radio is live. Kegorex reveals Trump's big plan to defeat ISIS very quickly. Don't shop at ISIS. And I think that's probably the extent of it. It is a reminder. Today is nine days until the big plan to defeat ISIS is due on Mr. Trump's desk, courtesy of his generals. You'll, of course, recall that he swore on a stack of Bibles during his campaign. That he, well, first that he had a plan, and only he had such a plan, to defeat ISIS totally and maybe even kick their ass. Uh, but just to be sure, he was going to ask his generals, his generals, to provide to him on his desk in 30 days the uh, plan to defeat ISIS that he would, I guess, then carry forward and implement and yada, yada, yada. Anyway, uh, let's see. All he's done so far is screw up the Yemen raid. That becomes a growing story, and that's continues to fester just beneath the surface, but so many other things are festering beneath the surface. I don't know. I'm not certain I can identify the surface anymore. The whole place is just roiling. Many, many things going on. The uh, Ninth Circuit's, uh, I I was going to say, the least surprising thing of the morning was to find out that, one, uh, Trump had tweeted out an article that he thought was being critical of the Ninth Circuit's decision unanimously in a per curiam decision, which we'll discuss a little bit later on and what that means and and, and some of the commentary that's been uh, offered up on that. But uh, to unanimously reject his position, now the government's, believe it or not, the government's position, uh, but he thought this article supported his point. Uh, It's a lawfare article. And uh, ordinarily, you would think it wouldn't be a, a difficult thing to figure out whether a lawfare article supported the expansive readings of governmental powers or not. But this time it was apparently wrong. And uh, <clears throat> he, he tweeted out, uh, I didn't even see the tweet, but uh, here's what caught my eye. This is this is what you need to know. Jonathan Chait from the Jonathan Corner this morning uh, I knew immediately what was going on. It says, I was curious how Trump heard of lawfare. Well, he saw it on TV, of course. I don't even need to read you what actually uh, 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 the um, the lawfare article says, although we'll, we'll take a look at it. Uh, Jonathan's tweet includes a tweet from Ethan Clapper, who says, by the way, yes, uh, Morning Joe was talking about this at the top of the hour and uh, says uh, at 8.03, Morning Joe had this on their screen. We'll take a look at the screen capture here. They were they put this up in discussing things. Come on, open it up here. Let's go. Uh, so they had a screenshot of the Lawfare blog with a, 
a, a, a poll quote that says this, and I guess this is what motivated Trump. Remarkably, in the entire opinion, the panel did not bother even to cite this statute, and I'm not sure which statute they're speaking of, but which forms the principal statutory basis for the executive order, see sections 3C, 5C, and 5D of the order. That's a pretty big omission over 29 pages, including several pages devoted to determining the government's likelihood of success on the merits of the case. But it's not a any kind of huge mistake. But, of course, I guess Trump took it as some kind of... Uh, um, indication that the order or the uh, that the the court's opinion on the order couldn't possibly be valid because they didn't devote any space to quoting the statute, which apparently is the principal statutory basis for this executive order. Not necessary, although I think good form usually to provide that. Trump seized on it, and uh, apparently by eight fifteen was tweeting angrily about. Uh, the uh, how the the decision was such a disgrace because yada yada yada. All right, and I guess that this is it here. Uh, lawfare, he writes. Remarkably, in the entire opinion, the panel did not even bother to cite th- this parentheses the statute. A disgraceful decision. It goes on to say. So anyway, yeah, it's not that he's reading lawfare; it's that he's watching television and the people on TV. Red Lawfare, and I guess, I don't know why I didn't see the, mor- you can bet your ass I didn't see the Morning Joe segment. No chance I was going to do that. Um, but, I, and I don't know in what context they brought up the Lawfare article, but it hardly matters. There was no chance of his reading it. And there's so many other similar examples out there. This is just one part of the storyline of whatever he sees on TV, he believes and begins tweeting angrily about. Uh, I did see somebody make the uh, great comment today. Let me see if I can't pull it up. I might as well just read you my morning Twitter feed. That'll pretty much uh, wrap things up. But <clears throat> somebody uh, made this comment, and I had to retweet it. Uh, yeah, here we are. Jay from Brooklyn, who tweets as TBC J J A Y. The others are just the letters. TBC J. Uh, he just says, uh, I bet if Trump saw on TV that he resigned, he'd just pack up his bags and go. And he, he very well might have done that. I don't know. All right. We'll get back to the, uh, to the Ninth Circuit decision at some point in the near future. I want to get, I do want to actually give, uh, Armando an opportunity to chime in if he's got something to say on that one. Otherwise, we have some very good articles on it. But I think we really need to just dance around the outside of a lot of these things today. There's some bigger, larger overarching themes i think that we have to mine from out of a couple of different uh, sources today it's it's just i don't really know what to say it's really incredible uh, uh but pocket is taking its sweet time opening so i don't know anything i can't tell you uh, uh things i want to get to today um uh, well we'll make mention of the fact that I guess Kellyanne Conway had to backpedal and apo- ended up apologizing, I think, for the embarrassment it caused to the administration to Donald Trump uh, for plugging <laughs> the Ivanka Trump line on TV. That was quite, very quickly pointed out. Uh, it is it's a violation of governmental ethics laws like actual statutes, and everybody pointed out the statute. So of course, it's one of those statutes that doesn't really have a prescribed remedy in it. And when it's from inside the White House, then it's kind of up to the White House to decide how it's going to deal with the issue and whether or not to uh, whether or not to to uh, to do anything about it. Essentially, I mean, if it's if it happens elsewhere in government, the prosecutors can take care of it. But, uh, you know, when it's inside the White House and the chief prosecutor, well, I mean, it's the attorney general just confirmed. I guess that's in the news as well. Anyway, you can basically bet that they're going to waive everything and just say, right, we, we talked to her. She's not going to do that again. But it's nice to see her chastened, I guess. Not that I really thought it was going to bring down the administration. On the other hand, some other things might. Uh, I see Greg tweeting about this, and we'll, we'll have to get to this one, too. He just uh, tweeted out, the big idea, which I guess would be another big story for today. 
Either the national security advisor misled the vice president, we're talking about Mike Flynn and Mike Pence here, or the vice president knowingly misled the American people. Uh, uh Uh-oh. Well, those are two very annoying but distinct possibilities. Of course, we are talking here about uh, the news that broke overnight. Uh, Where did I put it? Washington Post. That's the hottest, one of the hottest items going as well. National Security Advisor Flynn discussed sanctions with Russian ambassador, and we kind of thought that he might have, right? Uh, Despite denials, officials say. So uh, where do you want to go? Do you want to to start with that? You want to start with what's going on in the Senate? I'll update you on that. Uh, We knew Jeff Sessions was confirmed the other day. Last night's work was the confirmation of... uh, Tom Price as Secretary of Health and Human Services, this despite, of course, all of his insider trading. The Democrats in the Senate spent the night complaining about that, and rightly so. And guess what? Straight party line vote on confirmation of Price anyway. Yet, this all marches on, and and, uh, I did see people noting that in my timeline this morning, and Rebecca Roman's pointing out, yeah, more bad news. And and it's it's not good news, but let me give give you this. this isn't exactly going to cheer anybody up, but there wasn't anything we could do to block these nominations. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, that's your own fault, of course. Uh, when the Democrats use the nuclear option and change the rules for executive appointments and lower court judicial appointments, that set all of this in motion. And that's true, but I think we also recognized at the time, we knew that this could be turned around. I mean, that that was the first question anybody ever asked us. Uh, and, it, and it continued to be the first question anybody ever asked us all the way to the end and even afterwards. Um, but it's one of the things you're going to have to deal with. Of course, we weren't counting on someone quite as uh, mendacious as Trump occupying the Oval Office, but we certainly knew that it could be used against us. But the, you know, the filibuster is kind of a ridiculous anachronism and probably shouldn't be there and available. But Republicans and Trump, and uh, you have to count them separately, I guess, uh, have been complaining bitterly over the last couple of days about the horrible obstructionism, which is, I mean, we'll get them hypocrisy points, I guess, and everybody has to roll their eyes at Republicans, especially congressional Republicans, crying about obstructionism. But again, I'll point this out. We said this yesterday. Or, or a couple of days ago, and we were, I will reiterate it, and you will need it for discussion. And after all, Friday shows are all about what you need for discussion over the weekends and going forward, right? People say, oh, it's terrible, the Democrats are obstructing everything. What are they obstructing? What? I know that won't, that won't this won't cheer you up either. It's not, not what this is designed for. <clears throat> but who's, who's been blocked? What nomination has been denied? Everybody that Republicans have brought to the floor has been confirmed. Sometimes, even with Democratic votes, but typically not that many, thankfully, and the, the fewer the better, as far as I'm concerned. But everybody that Republicans have brought to the floor has been confirmed. Every single one. Is the pace slower? Yeah, the pace is slower. But everybody's had a vote. Everybody's been confirmed. And you're crying about the pace? Let me tell you something. Nobody... Of late, and nobody past the first couple of days got more than 60 votes, right? Maybe Elaine Chow did. Uh, Mike, uh, well, I guess, uh, let's see, Kelly and Mattis and maybe Chow and perhaps one or two others. And maybe Pompeo got more votes. I don't know. But uh, of late, everyone who's been, we've been really dragging out the confirmations on has passed by the barest of majorities. In other words, it wouldn't have happened without filibuster reform. And I know that there are Democrats who say, see, that's terrible. We should never have done that. But, uh, you know, let me give you this rhetorical tool, right? We say everybody the Republicans have been bringing to the floor has, has been confirmed. Nobody's missed. No nominations have gone down, period. This, despite the fact that half of them haven't even filled out their ethics paperwork or their financial disclosure paperwork before their hearings began, and some of them didn't even finish yet. Uh, the labor secretary, Puzder, is still up in the air. He hasn't done anything. The agriculture secretary was named, I think, just in the days before 
inauguration, but he's uh, Trump has not yet sent the nomination notice of the nomination to them. I don't know whether that's that that could be just plain. I didn't realize I had to do that, and the White House doesn't have any idea how things run. They seem to, you know, make it work on the twentieth though, which was two days after he decided who the agriculture secretary was going to be, and I've already forgotten. But anyway, they haven't sent the nomination. That's probably because they haven't filled out this paperwork. Everybody they've sent, though, has been has gotten their vote. Everybody that they've sent has been confirmed, and half of them would not have been confirmed but for the Democrats clearing the way. Democrats who changed the filibuster rules in most cases, knowing full well that it would, in fact, generously benefit the next Republican administration whenever that might happen to occur, swept this stuff aside because they thought, at least at the time, and I don't know whether they all still agree, but the president is generally speaking entitled to his or her choices for the cabinet, his or her nominations to fill his or her administration. I don't know that that's necessarily the case in in this instance because I don't know that this guy is qualified to be president despite the fact that we've gone and and uh and 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 elected him apparently or at least the electoral college has even if the rest of us didn't uh and uh gosh that reminds me of another story we have to take a look at just how dangerous it is to have someone this clueless and uh and and egotistical and venal to use that word again in uh in office and uh, it, it's it's really rather amazing that this is, I don't know how long this can go on. Where should we start? I guess we should just get to some of these articles that uh, express the thoughts a little bit more concisely. All right. <clears throat> Where shall we start? How about with the one I just hinted at? Uh, Ian Milheiser has a piece here that I have not yet had a chance to read, but the the title, the headline, the uh, and the first couple uh and the subheader, both, they certainly hint at a theme that I think is absolutely essential. Uh, we all know, the rest of the stuff I think is background stuff that we all share. A lot of us have already read this or already felt this or we've discussed it before. This, I think, gives a, a particular piece. If it doesn't, if the piece doesn't provide it, I'll provide it when we're done. How about that? Ian Milheiser at Think Progress. The unique legal problem presented by a know-nothing president. It's not just, well, he's dumb and that's a problem. It is, but there's more. The law, this is the subhead I liked, the law is not built for Donald Trump. That's kind of a theme that I've hit on, not only with Donald Trump, but with uh, even with George W. Bush back then. I, but it's a different, it had a, a slightly different bent. But yeah, the law is not built for these kind of hardball tactics. And I, I don't even call... Donald Trump stuff, hardball tactics. It's just knucklehead tactics, what's going on here. Anyway, uh, let's take a look at this. I, I don't know where they got this weirdo picture to illustrate it, but any uh, the dumber the picture, the better, as far as I'm concerned, when you're, you're talking about illustrating an article about Trump. I think he's blowing a kiss in this picture. Anyway, all right, let's get to Ian's piece. Eight of the most powerful words in American national security law are, you ready for this? The President of the United States has determined. Why? What's he talking about? The Trump administration's motion to a federal appeals court asking to restore Trump's Muslim ban starts with these eight words. In that case, Washington, the state, versus Trump, the President of the United States has determined that, quote, deteriorating conditions, unquote, in seven majority Muslim nations, quote, Increase the likelihood that terrorists will use any means possible to enter the United States, unquote. That is rather a mishmash, and it's not even that many words. And so the administration asked the court to defer to that presidential determination. All right. For now, Trump has not fared well in this case, Washington. On Thursday evening, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit announced that it would leave a temporary order suspending Trump's travel ban in place. Their opinion, however, still leaves many open questions, and the legality of Trump's travel ban is all but certain to wind up before the Supreme Court, eventually. Trump's request for judicial deference, moreover, was not frivolous. Trump roots much of his executive order suspending travel from these nations on a federal law, providing that, quote, 
whenever the president finds that the entry of any aliens or of any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, they may, any president who does this then, may, for such period as he shall deem necessary, or she, by the way, but it doesn't say that, suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants. But do you see what Ian is getting at here? The president's words have power. When he says something is true... And this is why it's such a huge problem with Donald Trump. When he says something is true, the law often bends to his will. Of course, the law having been designed for a president who would feel constrained from simply arbitrarily or capriciously, for that matter, uh, declaring certain things which everyone knows not to be true, to be true. And yet no habit better defines every waking hour of Donald Trump's life than simply asserting that things everyone else knows to be untrue to be true. That's a huge problem, especially for a system of law that bases so much of what the president can do by executive order on level-headed, serious, and thoroughly vetted decisions and determinations of the president backed by evidence and good thinking. And that's never going to happen in the Trump administration. I'll continue with Ian's right up of it. Calls for deference pervade the Supreme Court's national security cases. They always have. That's true. Unlike the president and some designated members of Congress, the justices warned in 2008's Boumediene versus Bush. Neither the members of this court nor most federal judges begin the day with briefings that may describe new and serious threats to our nation and its people. Information on national security threats, quote, can be difficult to obtain and the impact of certain conduct difficult to assess, the court explained two years later. Normal presidents swim in a sea of information, Ian writes. They gorge themselves on the most recent intelligence. Judges do not possess a fraction of this knowledge, so they second-guess the president's national security judgment at their own and at the nation's great peril. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, by the way, I have uh, uh, in my timeline here, Angela Grant, M.D., who says, I disagree that Trump's actions are arbitrary and capricious. Well, I don't. How's that, Angela? Does that satisfy you? Uh, I don't know who she is, but it uh, doesn't really matter a great deal <laughs> in order for me to express that. But uh, I, she's probably uh, referring to I, I tweeted Ian's article around that says every decision he makes is arbitrary and capricious. And uh, well, uh, here's my first guess here. I mean, Angela Grant may be an MDJD. There are such animals out there. But uh, arbitrary and capricious is a term of art in administrative law. And I don't know whether it enters as a term of art into medical practice. But uh, I, I'm assuming that what she means here is that, oh, no, he's very calculating and is doing these things. Yeah, okay, Trump's actions lay the foundation to discriminate and advance uh, Wall Street values and ideologies. Uh, and the answer is, no, not all of them do. Uh, and uh, I would come back to the basic premise, which I reject, which is that Trump has some kind of grand strategy. Bannon may have a grand strategy. It's a crackpot theory behind his grand strategy. Don't mistake him for a smart person. He's a clever conspiracy theorist who knows what dummies want to hear when they want to think that the person they're listening to is smart. But that's it. Trump doesn't even rise to that level. He literally is arbitrary and capricious. He, I mean, he certainly thinks he's doing things for his own benefit, yes. But he's often wrong about that. Well, at any rate, perhaps we'll carry on this conversation with Angela later on. She's not listening to the program. She's referring to a tweet. And we'll have to get back to the tweeting business later. Back to Ian for the moment, though. What happens when the President of the United States is a short-fingered reality show host? It doesn't matter that he has short fingers, but it's, it's funny. With little interest in informing himself. 
What if we have a president who's spending his intelligence briefings tweeting about his daughter's clothing line? Which we do, by the way. What if his policies are rooted less in real concerns about national security and more in a desire to punish people of certain faiths? What if the president's determinations are no better informed than your Fox News watching uncle's rants? And again, I just want to pause here to say that so much, not just national security law, but lots of administrative law across the government is set in motion or, or it only, it only works or it works very differently if there's a presidential determination of something which usually requires a lot of vetting and a lot of background government work and a lot of careful thought and gaming out of what's this going to mean if we set this process in motion. For somebody who doesn't give a crap one way or the other how they come to their determinations, that's an enormous amount of power to have handed over. I mean, we knew we were handing over an enormous amount of power, but we were mostly concerned about nuclear weapons and... You know, I guess we had some, we had certainly had some national security fears just in terms of his, uh, declaring people to be enemy combatants. But that's, that's precisely what we're really talking about here. I, I, I think everybody has an innate understanding of that, but I want to back up and just point out what's the, the real nuts and bolts mechanism of this. We all kind of have, as lay people, the understanding that uh, you know, I heard somewhere and read along the line, and it certainly has been demonstrated in the past, the president can kind of, or, or some people just thought they were joking around. Well, he's going to throw you in Guantanamo Bay. He's going to declare you a terrorist. But the basis of that kidding around or even just legitimate worrying aloud is, when you get right down to the brass tacks of it, that there's so much power that the Congress has granted the executive branch uh, with the understanding that someone would it, there would always be an occupant of the white house who would exercise it carefully and we now don't have that uh when congress is trying to decide well what are we going to do about you know sneaky terrorists who sneak into the country and don't declare at the border yeah i'm coming to kill people i'm coming to perpetrate a mass uh, uh terrorist event here you know, recognizing that reality, but Congress didn't really know. Uh, you, how do you write a statute that says, well, uh, we want you to stop people at the border if they say they're going to be terrorists or if they do something terroristy, then put them in Guantanamo Bay. And you have to put that in legislative language. And so what they basically are saying is, you know, on a case by case basis, we'll make these determinations. Who's going to make these determinations? All right. The president will. Well, you're going to just leave it in one person's hands? Well, yes, but no. I mean, how do we mean yes, but no? Yes, the president is going to be the person who puts a name to paper and takes personal responsibility for this determination, but the president isn't going to be the one determining if somebody is a terrorist or not. Perhaps, perhaps, in the rare case that there's disagreement among his top advisors. But in most cases, they won't even bring something to him if there is disagreement among top advisors. But when Obama would do something like this, and it was it was still problematic, obviously, and there were certainly people who made a career of screaming into the wind about this being a problem. But uh, yeah, it comes down to Barack Obama says yay or nay on, is this person a terrorist? Are they? Uh, we're going to have a trial? No, in some cases. Uh so really, you're just going to let the president determine that? Well, yes, but the president, I mean, nobody brings him the paper that he has to sign unless hundreds of staffers, you know, I, I mean, certainly a dozen or so of the top level people and the dozens of dozens of people below them uh, have met, conferred, fought back and forth between agencies and sub-agencies, staff meetings and all sorts of, I mean, you wouldn't believe the staff work that goes into getting to the stage where five or six principals sit down with the president and say, we think there's somebody that you're going to have to make this kind of presidential determination on, and it's a tough call. Usually it's not that tough of a call. I mean, it's weighty. Telling, I mean, particularly when you're, de you're detaining uh, 
enemy combatants without any connection to the United States physically or by way of citizenship and things like that. You're really talking about, uh, it's even harder, of course, when you're talking about people who do have some connection to the United States or are, in fact, American citizens living overseas in terrorist camps and doing these things. You have to make the determination, you know, can the president really exercise this kind of power to, without trial, deprive someone of life or liberty if you happen to capture them and just and, and hold them without charges indefinitely. This was enormously troubling. But it never comes to the president's desk. It, the, the, we haven't even reached the paper stage where he has to actually sign something and make it so. There's first some kind of, I'm sure, principles meeting in which they debate whether or not to commit this to paper at all. And fight and fight and fight until they say, you know, one, I'm sure at that point the president says, if you're going to ask me to kill somebody with a drone overseas who's an American citizen, we're going to have to have unanimous agreement among the principles here about this is, this is what needs to be determined by the president. We got to make this determination. This person needs to be terminated. This is an enormous decision. And I'm not doing it alone. Presidents typically won't say that. They won't say, you know, yeah, I'll flip a coin. I'll make up my mind about it. I need you guys to back me up on this. This has got to be on the record. It's got to have a paper trail this high. This is a big deal. You know Trump does not give a crap about that. You know he's not going to. And he's not going to sit through the meetings to do that stuff. So even a doofus president, like maybe George W. Bush, for instance, would at least, though, say, you guys hash it out. If it gets past you because you've unanimously decided, then I'll trust your judgment. That's what an idiot president would do. I'll take your word for it and I'll sign whatever you bring me to sign. The problem with this particular idiot president is, one, he might not even give that deference to his advisors, but he probably does. But he pushes so much off on them and there aren't very many of them and they're not experienced and they're idiots themselves and... They're bigoted, biased, conspiracy theory-minded, apocalyptic wackadoodles. And we already know that Steve Bannon is willing to bring the president completely idiotic uh, uh, executive orders and have him sign them, knowing he's not going to read them, even when it's something like, secretly putting him on the National Security Council, which even the president is pissed off about now that he's found out that he did it. That's an enormous problem when you know that if I put a coin in his mouth, I'm going to get the executive order and the presidential determination I decide on. And I don't have any input from anybody. There isn't any staff work going into my personal wish that this person would be determined to be an enemy combatant and be killed or imprisoned for the rest of their lives without charge in Guantanamo Bay. I just want that. Sometimes at the be at the outset that will be oh I, you know this or that terrorist leader. Later it'll be uh you know somebody who criticized me or the president or who I never liked or who owes me money or whatever. I mean, really, would you put it past Steve Bannon to say, well, I, I borrowed $100,000 from this person and they're trying to collect on it now and they're going to sue me. But uh, if I sneak this person's name into an executive order that says they're an enemy combatant and they should be sent to Guantanamo Bay in, and held indefinitely incommunicado – do you think Steve Bannon wouldn't put that in there? You know, ordinarily, you would say, no, come on. But he did do an, oh, come on, move, sticking in there, put me on a National Security Council. That would be pretty, uh, you know, uh, he might be, I wouldn't put it past him. I'll say that. But that that's the power that these presidential determinations have. And that's why Congress has been relatively confident in assigning the responsibility to the president because they know that almost anything the president does requires an enormous amount of research, background, staff work. Nothing gets to his desk without being vetted a 100,000 times over. So they ordinarily feel pretty comfortable saying things like, well, let the president determine it. Even though, you know, you and I, 
if it was just a couple of people hanging out making these decisions, well, why don't we uh, designate this guy over here, you know, whoever we're hanging out with over here, it, it'll be his determination. Now, you wouldn't leave it up to him because you'd want to say in it because you would, you, got, you would have no reason to believe that the person you had assigned the job to, even if you think he's the smartest one in the group or she's a lawyer, let's trust her. The, the, the vetting, the staff work, the background information – just isn't there with you or me but it's supposed to be there with the president so over the years since it's always been the case that there was careful consideration of everything always a hundred times over before it got to the point where the president could quote unquote make a determination so that wasn't problematic it didn't worry them now it does now it does so Let's return to uh, Ian's retelling and, and see what else that elicits from us. Uh, though it's unlikely that any of the judges hearing these cases will say so openly, this fundamental question, what happens when the president is fundamentally uninformed, is at the heart of many lawsuits tra- uh, challenging Trump's travel ban. So who do you trust is our next section here. Ordinarily, the argument that the president should be trusted because he sees intelligence that the rest of us don't, is a powerful one. Judges do not know the things that they do not know. So who are they to second-guess the man at the apex of one of the most sophisticated intelligence-gathering machines in the known universe, right? And this was, of course, always Alberto Gonzalez's position, and we didn't believe in it then, and it was troubling and frightening when George W. Bush was president. It was troubling, but I would venture to guess that for most of us listening to the show, a little less frightening when Barack Obama was president, mostly because, and this is an intangible, but mostly because we trusted in his abiding interest in doing things the best he could. Do your best, kids. That's the thing. That's the message. But to do things as carefully as he could, to consider everything carefully, we would very often, I'm sure, individually disagree with his conclusions and underlying it all is still the incredible danger that uh, comes from giving one person ultimately too much decision-making power over questions of life and liberty. Uh, But in some cases, I guess, well, I don't know. Certainly some of us were willing to throw up our hands and say, I don't really know how to take on this particular monster. I just am glad that there's somebody who I think of as a deliberative person, a a smart, thorough, careful, and concerned person at the top of this making these decisions. And when it's an idiot, I'm worried. George W. Bush, the idiot, worried me. This vapid moron, this egomaniac idiot, Really worries me. But I digress. Or do I? Let's see. So where were we here? Trump's executive order also arises at a very unfortunate time for its defenders. Just one week before Trump signed this order, Susan Rice was sitting in, uh, was the sitting president's national security advisor. Barack Obama's, of course. Lisa Monaco was President Obama's counterterrorism advisor. John Kerry was secretary of state. These three very senior former national security officials, along with a bipartisan group of former cabinet secretaries, CIA directors, and top-level advisors, all signed a declaration stating that they are, quote, unaware of any specific threat that would justify the travel ban established by the executive order issued on January 27th, 2017. To the contrary, they argue Trump's order ultimately undermines the national security of the United States rather than making us safer. Well, that's interesting because, of course, uh, these are the very people whose input we believed made it likely that Barack Obama's judgment on such questions was worthy of the trust we've placed in it and that Congress has placed in it in designing the law to give the president this kind of power. They say none of what is known, none of the secret things that you and I are never privy to, would indicate that this was necessary or even helpful 
in fact, that it was harmful. It wasn't even a neutral thing. This would actually make things worse. These guys are privy to the secrets that we're not privy to. In fact, they were pri- well, I guess uh, for they were privy to the secrets that Donald Trump was privy to but paid no attention to during the transition period. That's problematic too. And they say it makes things worse to do this. Sure, there's an ideological disagreement, but at, at bottom, they had access to the information and paid attention to it. He was given access to the information, but didn't pay attention to it. He says, do it. They say, don't. That's worrisome. And now, Ian points out, good point here, there's no legal doctrine stating that a president is owed less deference in the early days of their presidency. But the fact remains that Rice, Monaco, and Kerry very recently had access to the nation's most sensitive national security information, and they think Trump's order is wrongheaded. This isn't the case where judges need to trust the president because the president has unique information that no one on the other side of the case has seen. And there are reasons to doubt Trump's judgment on top of all of that. Shortly after Trump handed down his order, the former New York City mayor and Trump confidant Rudy Giuliani gave an extraordinary interview to Fox News where he claimed to have played a key role in designing Trump's order. And here's the quote. Okay, I'll tell you the whole history of it. So when Trump first announced it, he said, Muslim ban. He called me up and he said, put a commission together, show me the right way to do it legally. And what we did was we focused on, instead of religion, danger. The areas of the world that create danger for us, which is a factual basis, not a religious basis, perfectly legal, perfectly sensible, and that's what the ban is based on. Now, Ian continues, the legal term for what Giuliani described here is a pretext. Trump wanted a Muslim ban, but he knew that he couldn't legally state openly that banning Muslims was his goal. I'm glad someone informed him of that. So he brought together a team of lawyers and they found a way to cloak Trump's real intention. Instead of announcing that the United States was banning Muslims outright, according to Giuliani, the White House picked out nations that they could claim were more likely to, quote, create danger for us, nations which also happened to be majority Muslim. That way, they could claim that they had a valid, non-discriminatory reason for handing down the executive order. But Trump hasn't really tried to hide from the claim that the stated reason for his order is merely a pretext. On the campaign trail, he repeatedly promised to implement a, quote, Muslim ban. A provision of the executive order gives priority to refugees who, quote, who practice, quote, a minority religion in the individual's country of nationality, i.e., for a for a Muslim majority country. That would be anything that's not Muslim, right? On the same day that the executive order was handed down, Trump indicated to the Christian Broadcasting Network that he will use this provision to give special treatment to Christians, not just Zoroastrians or whoever else might be residing in these majority Muslim countries, Normally, someone who engages in unlawful discrimination, and just in case there's any doubt about it, it is almost always illegal for the government to treat people differently because of their faith. Ordinarily, someone who does this can't excuse such discrimination simply by dressing it up with a pretext. Otherwise, a racist employer could fire all their minority employees so long as they invented fake reasons for doing so. And believe me, people have tried. Trump's core legal argument in the Muslim travel ban cases, however, is that the courts simply have to trust him when he says that his stated justification for the ban is the real reason. When the executive exercises its power to exclude a foreign national, quote, on the basis of a facially legitimate and bona fide reason, the Supreme Court indicated in its 1972 Kleindienst v. Mandel case, The courts will neither look behind the exercise of that discretion nor test it by balancing its justification against the First Amendment interests of those who seek personal communication with the applicant. Trump says that he is excluding certain people because he thinks they may be dangerous. And the courts, at least according to Trump's lawyers, are forbidden to peek behind the curtain to see if he's telling the truth. 
We've certainly heard that from national security lawyers in the past, right? As the New Yorker's Amy Davidson writes, a central question in the Muslim travel ban case is whether the courts or the American people have any recourse when the president lies. If Trump is lying, and there's strong evidence suggesting that he is, existing legal doctrines are equipped to handle that problem. As Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote in a 2015 opinion, the general rule that courts may not look into the executive branch's true motive for excluding a foreign national can be breached when there is, quote, an affirmative showing of bad faith, unquote. It's got its parallels in business law, which we might be, maybe more listeners are perhaps familiar with. Uh, the old uh, doctrine of piercing the corporate veil. The corporate entities generally get a lot of deference in the courts, too. The business decision rule that we've complained about on this show before. You know, it may have been a terrible decision, but you got to have the latitude to make terrible decisions as a business owner. It's when it's done for other purposes or you act outside of your authority or it's done with corrupt purpose. Uh, that it becomes possible to say, all right, well, you're no longer entitled to the blanket protection of to, to make bad decisions. Now we want to know why you made this decision. If we can demonstrate that there was something completely uh, wrong, something underhanded, uh, that you were lying, that you were making this decision fraudulently, etc. cetera. Uh, I'll, I'll continue just for a second here, but Armando is ready to join in on this one too. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that the part you're reading about Amy Davidson and taking the judge's, the, the president's word for it, yeah. it's a little misguided. There is actually procedures, uh, and indeed it's quoted extensively in the uh, Ninth Circuit decision that allow the administration to submit classified information under seal. Yes, I mean, they certainly can no ways to show that. They can show they them. choose to. Yeah. They chose not to. Yeah, th- Maybe that there's no substance to it to show. It's, well, but who th- knows? That's, th- that, that's revealing as well. I mean, yeah. but the bird was on the government. Uh, yeah, on to reverse the stay. Yes, I mean, so it's worth it's worth pointing out that yeah, uh, courts uh, and, and higher up you go in the in the court hierarchy, the the uh, I guess the easier it is to manage things like this. Although at the appellate level, they often don't consider much much of this. Um, so actually, I guess at the, the appellate level, there's sort of a, a hole in between. And it, but district court judges, believe it or not, actually. Uh, uh, have considerable experience in some cases, particularly those in D.C., in uh, setting up uh, an ability to filter through highly classified information without revealing it in open court and, and very often uh, without having to even cite anything specific uh, in their decision-making. So it's not that they have to remain blind. They can check. But uh, usually, in the first instance, the government's insistence is, is most often, yeah, we're uh, entitled to deference here, and you have no right to inquire. You simply have to take our word for it. And when judges have reason to doubt that, they do have a mechanism for checking. And sometimes uh, it requires uh, assigning things to a special court, like the entirety of the, the FISA court is built entirely for that, when, when the exclusive range of your business is going to be dealing with national security information you know the, the it does it it's a it's a drain on the resources of of a normal court to deal with things like that sometimes they just have to but that's that's the reason there is a fisa court somebody that's set up for this all the time but anyway yeah no absolutely uh, we i were, mean it's not it's cumbersome but yeah. you know if national security requires it you do it yeah. right so uh, where we had left off was that we, we knew that uh, the, the general rule that courts may not look into the executive branch's true motive for excluding a foreign national, or really for any number of things, can be breached when there is an affirmative showing of bad faith. It's also far from clear that Mandel applies to a broad executive order such as Trump's Muslim travel ban. As the Ninth Circuit explains, that case involved an executive branch's an executive branch official's decision to issue or deny an individual visa. Trump's executive order, by contrast, announced a broad policy that sweeps up thousands of individuals. 
it's one thing to ask for deference to a very specific determination involving a very particular individual. It's another thing altogether to dispose of people in bulk. And that's true. What our current legal doctrines aren't equipped to handle, however, is what happens if a president is simply wrong. Although it's worse than that. He's not only simply wrong, he's mendacious and evil. But he doesn't get into that. What if Trump honestly believes, honestly believes, that his executive order is necessary to protect the nation's security? What if that was his sole basis for handing down the order, which is a slightly different problem? What if Trump is merely ignorant of the danger that his order will, in the words of Rice, Kerry, and other former national security officials who came out against it, endanger U.S. troops in the field, disrupt key counterterrorism, foreign policy, and national security partnerships, endanger intelligence sources in the field, disrupt ongoing law enforcement efforts, cause economic damage to American citizens and residents, and most likely feed the recruitment narrative of ISIL and other extremists that portray the United States as at war with Islam. Yeah, what if? The lawyers offer no good answers to these questions, and even if the Supreme Court ultimately concludes that Mandel does not apply to this executive order, such a determination still does not require the court to also conclude that Trump violated the Constitution. And anytime they can avoid that, they will. Yeah, I have to take a little issue with with that scenario you just said, you know, the counter narrative of what the proper national security analysis is. I actually don't think the court gets to do that. You know, they don't have to look at Susan Rice and say, well, she says this, Mr. President. What do you have to say to that? I don't think that's really what it's about. They don't Um, have to, no. In my view, uh, I, I, I do think that the... There needs to be some rational basis for Trump. Trump could be wrong in his national security analysis, but he has to have a rational basis. Yes, wrong why is permissible? Because he's he's implicating the the Constitution. This is actually something, David, that galled me this morning. Ben Whitty's, you know, playing the martyr here because Trump cited his article in uh, in a tweet this morning because yes. Witte scolded the Ninth Circuit. He said it was the right decision, but he scolded the Ninth Circuit for not going in depth into the statute that the executive order is based on. And as you, you may know, the, the statute itself does give wide discretion to the president to suspend travel from countries. Yes. That's the truth. But that doesn't mean it's unfettered. He still has to comply with the Constitution. Yes. It's so the issue is, well, can, the president, can the president issue travel bans? He can't. The question is, did in the issuance of his travel bans, did he run afoul of the Constitution? There were two arguments presented. Uh, well, three, but, uh, well, let me just give you the three. There was yeah. the due process argument, which was very compelling. There's number two was the equal protection, and number three was the statute. Violation. I'm sorry, can you restate court, that third one? Uh, the Establishment Clause, okay. religious uh, test, in essence. All right. Uh, uh, and the court, the Ninth Circuit, the, the, the per curiam court, said that the government had not shown enough to uh, uh, explain uh, how they didn't violate the Due Process Clause. And why, why is the Duplassus Clause uh, so, such so clear-cut, which is why they relied on it, in my view? Because there was no process at all for deciding this. You know, yes. you, you can't just uh, take away people's visas. That was the most, you know, tangible problem. Yeah. Uh, and say you're going to exclude green cards just based on some omnibus, blunderbus, uh, view that well maybe Trump thinks this it just it just it did not you know everybody's visa frankly needs to be reviewed every single one you got to give them individual process to the visas you'd already issued so I think that the, the problem was people well I got to decide if the president has the power no you got to decide if the president violated the Constitution he has the power but he has to use it within the framework of the Constitution and the Ninth Circuit said they had not proven a likelihood of success that they had used it constitutionally and did not run afoul of the due process clause. So 
enough boring you. Back to you. No, I think that's an extraordinarily important point, and it's 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 very fine point, and it's nuanced that you know just Trump just can't get his head around, and not that many people really can. I mean, it it is it's it becomes a simpler point, I guess, if you immerse yourself in constitutional law, as not a whole lot of people have. But uh, sure. it's still something I think is very understandable to lay people with just a little bit of discussion. It, it's not that the president doesn't have this discretion, but it's that discretion means something in particular, not if you sign it, then your discretion has been exercised. No, the signature is an indication of a number of reasoning steps that are assumed to come before it. Not just, I want this, so therefore I will, quote-unquote, use my discretion. I mean, think about the actual definition of discretion that most people use, that there's careful consideration of the implications that goes into this, and there wasn't any time for that kind of careful consideration, and no evidence that it had ever been considered in any way, shape, or form. They didn't, or maybe that they decided not to present such evidence, but... Discretion Im- implies a great deal more than simply, well, I said it, so I exercised my... The discretion was I either could have uttered the words or not, and the decision to utter them is my exercise of discretion. That doesn't, that doesn't pass muster. If it did, then the Constitution wouldn't stand in any way in the path of dictatorship by an elected president. I mean, we, we elected him, so from now on he, we can, you know, he gets to do whatever he wants? Nah, not quite. He has an enormous amount of power so long as he can provide some rational basis for the decisions he makes. I want it is, it can't be, you can't have that be the basis for decision making and be a constitutional republic. So, what do you do? Well, the Ninth Circuit says, I prefer constitutional republic to making this complete moron happy for the day. I'm going to give this kid his toy. And this is absolutely critical because, you know, the argument isn't, as far as I know, that the statute that Trump's executive order is based on, the one that gives him this power, is unconstitutional. It's not unconstitutional on its face. The application of that power by Trump is the one that is being challenged on constitutional grounds. This is something that people should understand. This is, in essence, an as-applied challenge. Let me Think of it this way. Instead of an executive order, Trump asked Congress to pass this ban. Yes. This right. spe- specific ban for these seven countries. And they codify it, and they make a law, and he signs it. And someone says that's unconstitutional. It's like, no, it's just like every other mm-hmm. case. The president isn't exempt from the Constitution. Congress isn't exempt either. Ergo, that's why, you know, <laughs> yes, uh, there are cases in the Supreme Court. The, the notion that the president is exempt from constitutional review and the exercise of his powers mm-hmm. is crazy. Well, yes, uh, although it's something that we've been fed for a decade or more, nearly two decades at this point, um, in shorthand, by beginning with the George W. Bush administration and, and his White House uh, and Justice Department lawyers who, for the purposes of getting a sound bite in the paper that kind of, sort of explained what was going on, was expressed as, well, look, the president has the power to do this. He's, he's, and he's unfettered by the other branches in this and exercising this power. And But the full story, even as boring as it is, if you really read the briefs or you even listen to people, you know, wackos like John Yoo, even John Yu would every once in a while be forced to nod to what it is you're talking about here. Can the president, uh, the, the famous debate thing, can the president order torture to crush the yeah. testicles of a chi- of the, of the, of the child of a suspected terrorist in order to prevent an attack? And John Yu, as much as of an extremist as he is, never said, yes, sure, I told you at the outset anything he wants to do, period. No, his answer, as much as we ridiculed it, was, it depends why the president feels he needs to do that. And what he meant by that, as crazy as that sounds, is 
That's the discretion we're talking about. The the powers come uh, with this requirement that there be a rational basis. Now, if you can come up with a rational basis for pulling this kind of torture, I mean, I don't know what it would be, but I'll leave the door open to the possibility because this is a theoretical debate. It depends why the president feels he needs to do that. 99 times out of 100, you're not going to get away with it. But I don't know. I, imagine, imagine the scenario. I can't, but... Uh, that's what he was saying, and that's why I mean that's why it comes out sounding so ridiculous. Is it's a very weird thing, and and uh, up until now we've never had a real reason that was agreed to by so many people on both sides of the aisle, or however many sides this aisle has, that we really might be looking at a president who literally doesn't give a crap one way or the other what his own reasons. I don't even care about my own reasons. I feel it. I saw it on television. Yeah, I mean, there's there's something that, though, that is, in essence, correct in, I mean, John Hughes, I'll leave that aside because I don't, you know, I mean, you, you, you've given a, a, as favorable a framing as what he said that is possible. I, I mean, his fundamental assumption is just wrong. The president doesn't get to ignore the Constitution if it's a good reason. There's no, that's not how it works. <laughs> we, we at least framework it. That the president has constitutional powers in certain settings, national security, that are more deferred to. We defer yes. to his judgments, but we never, he never has a power. And that's really, it's a question of deference and reviewability. The, 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 the argument that has been forwarded that the president can do something that is non-reviewable by a court, you know, that's, I mean, that, that impacts other citizens. Now, listen, you know, the inter, the interbranch battles, maybe that's a political question. You know, maybe those doctrines uh, can come into play. The emoluments clause is actually a good example of something that may not be justiciable. Uh, because, but the the main reason it's not justiciable is this hard. This hard to Congress is the uh, well, not Congress, but you know, the amorphous people are. Uh, as opposed to individual and specific people are the ones who are being harmed. There's really, it's more of a standing problem than anything else. But here there are specific people who got their visas revoked. Yeah. So the president can't just go around and let, let me put it to you this way. Can you just throw people in jail under national security grounds? They tried that with Padilla. Yeah. Remember? Mm -hmm. No. And the answer is he can't. Why not? I mean, it's national security, right? Listen, you know, the Milligan decision, which people throw around, you remember that one, it's the, on the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus during a civil war, right? Yeah. And remember, the Constitution actually provides a basis for suspension of the habeas corpus, right, in times of insurrection. Yeah, right. The Constitution actually provides a, the, a basis for what Lincoln wanted to do. He should have just gone to Congress first and had them suspended. That was his problem, and he would have gotten it. I guess he didn't think about it or whatever. But uh, here, the, the, you know, the, the the argument is there's two branches of government. You remember the whole Jackson formulation of how you view presidential power, the 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 the, the, the at its highest ebb and its lowest ebb. You remember that from the mid aughts when they, everything Bush did we used Judge Jackson's concurrence which I mm. prefer another opinion of that in the steel uh, the steel mill case uh, okay. for Truman and here frankly in theory if you apply it uh, Trump's power is at its highest because there's an express uh, congressional authorization for him to act here but that really doesn't waive everything it still has to go through the process here, the problem that I see is Trump has not this has decided that he's not going to justify his decision to the court. He's not going to explain it. Trust me. Trust me, it's not good enough. And I do think that the real politic, the legal realist thing here, and Mark Halpern tweeted out today, well, the four uh, results-oriented liberal justices are going to vote against him. Like, you know, they're all... <laughs> results oriented oh, yes. all, you know me david i, I have right. i have no illusions about what the supreme court does they decide what they want to decide and then they figure out a way to justify it mm -hmm. and, and this is going to be no different 
I mean, I, I suspect it'll be 4-4 four, four if it gets to the Supreme Court or, you know, or 5-4 or once Gorsuch gets there. But the president can't tell the court, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. Trust me. That's not good enough. It should never yes. have been good and, enough. And by the way, and if they don't develop the record any more than they have at this point and really literally go to the Supreme Court and say, I'm not going to tell you my reasoning, if it's not 8 nothing, then the results-oriented people are on the conservative side. Right. That's exactly right. I, I totally agree with that. And, uh, I mean, the, the thing is, show us something. Now, what is the the problem is, what they're going to show you is, and this is the real problem for them PR-wise, you know, I'd be interested to see the legal uh, side of it. Now, there is actually a precedent, a Supreme Court precedent that actually supports Trump's actions here. You want to know what they what it is? Well, lawfare didn't print it, so he doesn't know about it. Don't, all right, every, no one tell him. Yes, go ahead. Tell right, us what it but, is. But but no, lawfare didn't print it. But let me tell you what the what the precedent is. It's Korematsu. Ah, great. He might know about that one already, or or uh, Bannon does. All right. Yeah. Listen, I think if everybody was honest about this, this is a Muslim ban. The argument for the Muslim ban is that. Most terrorist acts against the United States, I don't know if this is true, but it probably is true. Most terrorist acts uh, against the United States at this point in time in our history uh, are come from uh, Muslims. That's, I think, probably true. I don't have the imperial, empirical evidence, but, let's, but I think it is, it's, it's likely true that most terrorist acts, say 55, 60 percent, uh, uh, are, are from Muslims. And we think we shouldn't let Muslims in our country because of this fact. That's their argument, right? Uh, that's, yeah, that's the argument. That's the argument. So what do you have to say? We're explicitly banning Muslims because they're a higher, they're higher risk of being terrorists. Now, the risk is less than 1%. It's less than 0.1%. That's, yeah. that's the other empirical fact. There's, Billions of Muslims, and there's been, that we know of, hundreds at the most, terrorists that have tried to attack the United States. I don't even think you could count to a thousand. Yeah, because, unless you're going to count everybody that's fight, fighting a war, a terrorist, which we do, unfortunately. Yes. You know, the, 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 the so-called Bowling Green Massacre, by the way. <laughs> yes. What, what, were the, what did those guys do? Weapons procurement. Or allegedly uh, attempting right. weapons procurement but, but, for, for I mean, a war They elsewhere. told stories of how they fought against American soldiers in Iraq. Yeah. That's a battlefield. Yeah. Being a soldier doesn't make you a terrorist. At least, apparently, it does now, but it didn't before. Yeah. Well, we have a gigantic definitional problem with our, with our terrorism. I mean, the reason why we you had to, you know, do a little clarification tap dance about the relationship between Islam and terrorism is because there's plenty of terrorist attacks that fit every or other definition of terrorism, but they're perpetrated by white Christian extremists right here. Oh, absolutely. Home. So, you know, uh, just, I mean, everybody's every pretty clear about that. I guess the narrow class of terrorism you'd be talking about, uh, and, and, and what's so difficult about it is you have to get inside the head of the terrorist to really figure out, are, are, is your target America generally? Well, I, you know what's funny? Know. Everybody, that all the conservatives and frankly some liberals who hate hate crime legislation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Terrorism is a hate crime. Terrorism it's, is yeah. a hate crime. Who's how your come target? You, yeah. How come you're good with that particular yeah. crime? I don't know. And you, it used to, I guess, it, you, the term arose, I guess, at a time when Terrorism really was, it was a more generalized problem where we really don't even necessarily have a, an overarching goal in mind. We simply want to throw things into chaos and put people in primal fear of their lives all the time. You know, back in the old, back when the, in the days when the terrorism threat was chiefly, uh, European communist faction. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, I know. Great Anarcho example. That is actually terrific. That's a good memory, and people should remember that. There was terrorism. IRA, the Red Brigades, uh, the Bider-Meinhof gang. I yeah. mean, listen, 
there have been terrorists, non-Arab terrorists, for a long time. Yeah, and uh, and that's where the the uh, the terminology really first came into popular use, I think. And it wasn't until it probably took another ten years before it became uh, a, a tactic used by, well, chiefly I guess Palestinians in their own struggle, and uh, then it, a wider. Uh, I guess it took, took on wider provenance in the greater Middle East and Central Asia, but uh, yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't you know, invented by Muslims. That, in, in that respect, to, for many people, nine eleven changed everything because yes, it hit us yes. here, and all of a sudden, terrorism became radical Islamic extremism, yes. and that's all it is for, uh, frankly, too many Americans, probably a majority. They don't see everything else as terrorism. What they mean is radical Islamic extremism. Yes. By the way, I don't care about that phrase. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. Uh, I understand why you don't use it because it's offensive and, and, and it hurts you yeah. ability to, 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 to work with your allies, you know, but I mean, but you know, in terms of the logic of it, I don't have a particular problem with the phrase. It doesn't help us to, to fight quote, radical extremism to actually say it, then maybe we shouldn't say it because the fight is what matters, not what we call it. Mm -hmm. True, that's but, point. But uh, the, the idea that terrorism is just Muslim extremism is, frankly, a continuing development that happened because of 9-11. I mean, remember, in 1998, there were attacks on our embassies. Yes. Right? Right. And the coal was attacked. Nobody thought of that. Well, that... That's now that's terrorism, you know, and it became hmm. that that's not when we converted the word terrorism into radical Islamic extremism. It was 9-11. Yeah. Uh, and that also thrust Rudy Giuliani into our lives for 20 years. And that, you know, Bin Laden really, really screwed us. <laughs> A good catch there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> he as he was what he wanted to do. I, I, it's funny. I. And thinking this whole thing through as, as we discuss it more, you know, where was that turning point? I, I, to give you, I guess, here's, if I had to explain this to Donald Trump and he was open and open to listening to it and, and coming to understand this change in our definition of terrorism, I'd ask him, uh, okay, Mr. President, I gotta work on you, with you on your level here. Did you see, did you ever see the movie Die Hard? Yeah. Okay. And you remember how that, that plot went? I mean, was what they were doing, Terrorism. That's a, like a definitional question for you. And he, I they wonder were, whether he would I say no. I don't that movie not. as much as everybody else does. Oh. Were they stealing something? They were, in fact, just as they discovered, and this is a kind of a key point <laughs> at the bottom of this stupid movie. It turns out that, yeah, and, and it, they were really just stealing bearers' bonds, you know, an enormous cache of bearers' bonds, and, and, uh, one of the uh, chief characters in the movie says, discovers at the end, you mean all this nonsense, you're just nothing but a common thief. And then he has that angry outburst. Oh, extraordinary. I'm an extraordinary thief. <laughs> but but okay. he was blowing up a building chiefly to distract from the fact that he was emptying the vault in this thing. But the whole, uh, the, the, the beginning premise of the movie is he's, They've taken over this building and they've taken hostages and they're threatening to blow up the building and kill all the hostages inside and there's negotiations going on with the cops and et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But, but the, our lead, uh, terrorist here is, what's his name? Do you remember? Hans mm -hmm. Gruber. Yeah, right. It, it, Abdul, nothing, uh, you know, no kind of Nasir, nothing, you know, yeah. Right. There's not an Arab among them. 1988, this movie is. Yeah. Uh, and it involves blowing up and destroying the entirety of a presumably New York City, yeah, it is New York, New York City skyscraper. Well, okay, that bears some, you know, that's some relevance in our reality timeline here. But 1988, uh, and it was still a couple of years before the first attempt at bombing the World Trade Center, too. But 19, we were, we were pretty mature folks by that point, 1988, the country, uh, and those of us listening, some of us, I guess, listening weren't born, <laughs> maybe. But anyway, uh, yeah, not an Arab among them. But I wonder whether now people looking back at it say, yes, terrorism, blow up building, hostages, etc. Or did they buy the premise at the end? That, oh, no, it's just a robbery. 
That's yeah, and the, another example of that is if you remember the first season of 24, the terrorists were actually uh, uh, Serbians, I think, or, or uh, we, they were from the Balkans. I believe it was Dennis Hopper was the re- was the head terrorist. Uh, not yeah, it was Dennis Hopper. What I think. movie? Uh, no, it was the first season of 24, oh, first which happened of right around 9-11. Oh, it was. Yes, okay. But Serbian. Yeah, but it wasn't Muslim until season two, I think. Could have yeah, been season Serbian two. Muslim, but okay. He was And then they had Muslims <laughs> again in season three, but then they switched to something else. Anyway, the, the, the reality is the PLO, which you write, you know, the Kelly Loro and all that stuff, and the hijacking of planes and the attacks on airports in Europe – they were considered a terrorist organization, I think, yeah. and, uh, and, but they were one of many, and we didn't think of, well, we, you had to say an Arab terrorist organization as opposed to an Irish terrorist organization yes. or a, a German, German terrorist Italian, organization right. or, you know, for us, the, the United States, the Puerto, a Puerto Rican terrorist mm-hmm. organization. Right. But now you say terrorist, and that automatically just means Muslim. Everybody else is something different for some reason. Yeah, lone gunman or uh, lone, <laughs> right, you true. know, whatever they, whatever right. phrases they make up now. Bad for apple. Reason. Yeah, that's right. uh, yeah, interesting to say the least. Well, which actually bears on this, and uh, and the question that Trump's insistence that terrorism is only Islamic, which is really. Uh, yes, the heart of this, uh, that, and that, uh, as, as he's done, right, he's redefined the study of terrorism in our national security apparatus. And to literally exclude white Christian separatist, white supremacist violence from the definition of terrorism. What we're looking yeah, at, yeah, exactly. And that's at the heart of this Muslim ban, even though they want to call it a country ban. It's a Muslim ban. Yes. Yeah, you know, some some Muslim countries are excluded for pecuniary reasons. Even if they do business with Trump, I mean, I think that's pretty striking. Uh, but you know, it, it, and maybe for some other reason, I don't know that he has business ties in Pakistan. But you know, Pakistan mm-hmm. is one of is considered one of the places that produces the most terrorists, and uh, of course, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Yeah. But Pakistan's uh, not Middle Eastern, I guess, so they decided that's out. There, you know, there's actually a dilemma for Trump right now on that. The, there's a big movement to try to have the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt, particularly yes. the strongest in Egypt, uh, declare a terrorist organization. But if you do that, then you kind of have to add Egypt to the travel ban, don't you? You would think. So, you know, there's a lot of people arguing it's a bad idea for a lot yes. of other reasons. Well, and I'm although, not, I can't figure, I, I mean, even without the... Muslim Brotherhood question: How you don't include Saudi Arabia? I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, sure. that I, seems impossible. Honestly, to understand. even ask Trump supporters. I mean, if you go on a street and you say, "Okay, um, where do Muslim terrorists come from?" They probably <laughs> would answer quickly, and they'd be right. So they might say Iraq, Iran. I mean, if you, I suppose if you narrowed it down further, that where do Arab Muslim terrorists come from? I don't know if they know the difference, but, uh, but certainly Saudi Arabia, I mean, Saudi Arabia is a, is a frequent target of vilification among Trump supporters. And I don't think a whole lot of them actually, you know, if you drill down with them and they, and they, you don't distract them with other things that they can get mad at you about, they will probably tell you, yeah, I don't really know why we left Saudi Arabia out of this. That's dumb. They know where the 9-11 hijackers are from. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, if someone, you know, wanted to say, hey, Trump, you didn't include enough. Uh, you, know, you haven't heard that argument because, you know, yes, when, you, you wanna, when, when you operate right. a cult, no one questions the leader. That and, of course, we're, we'd be right about that and that would undermine the logic of it. But the likely outcome would end up being, oh, OK, well, we're going to ban more people. <laughs> and then we say, well, that wasn't what we wanted to do. You know, I, I, I guess the weirdest thing about it is... Uh, uh, is this, uh, how come no one tells Trump in the media or asks John Spicer this question today? Look, if this travel, if a travel ban of some sort is so essential immediately to our national security, why is the president not just retailoring an executive order 
that complies with the Constitution. Give it another shot. See if you can do it. Why are you playing this game? Go get your OLC. Oh, by the way, the OLC opinion. Is, ah, yes. uh, I forgot to mention before. You remember they said on its face it's right. it's legal. And, you know, they really can't. If they had done a real analysis, they'd have to deal with all the constitutional questions that the Ninth Circuit dealt with. But what they did is, look, here's the statute. It says the president has power. Here's the president exercising the power. Looks good to me. Yeah, that was a. We would. I mentioned it a couple of days ago that they they've been pretty clear on it and said we were just clearing it for form and legality. That is to say, it's on a rectangular piece of paper, and it bears the president's signature and reference to a statute that does say he can make this determination. It's That's up right. to the rest of you. And ordinarily, we would have analyzed whether he correctly made his determination and told you why. This would be an important part of the record in the appeal, but it doesn't exist now because they did it before the OLC was staffed and also probably didn't care what the OLC had to say because they didn't really know what the OLC was or how to use it. Yeah, it was really, you know, I mean, there's there's many things wrong with it, but one of the most striking things is how incompetent it was done, What you would have wanted to do to make it, as bulletproof as possible is have actually an extensive OLC memorandum making the argument why it not only is legal, but is constitutional. And that way, frankly, you've said, oh, I've looked, look at the president's looked at all these issues. He's grappled with the constitutional questions. This, yes. uh, this order was an attempt to, to comply with the constitution, et cetera, et cetera. And in that sense, I go, you know, you go back to your Ian Milhauser piece. This is where Trump hurts himself by acting like an idiot. The court sees that. So, well, this idiot didn't do any of the work he was supposed to do. So we're going to have to do it for him. Yes. It's a show your work problem from back in your high school math days. You just, all you did was put down an answer. X equals 25. If it was right, I'd give you half credit, but it's wrong. But I'd still give you half credit for being right. Uh, But the other half of the points comes from show me why x equals yeah. 25 yeah show me why it says look it's pretty clear you're excluding muslims here and pretty purposefully why do you get to do that and the reason i get to do that is a b c d here's the part that's got some classified information that we're going to submit to you under seal um here's the analysis done by the olc you know here here's how we dealt with it and frankly you know, I know they wanted this non-reviewability argument in there, but that was going to lose. I mean, that was just going to lose. Uh, it's bad. It was. It's a bad branch of law anyway, and mm-hmm. it really should never have, have come into play. But basically, the courts have ignored it. Listen, even in the aughts, we were just years away from it. You know, there were the the Hamdi decision, the Hamdan decision, the Bomadine decision. They all establish that, in fact, the court does review what you're doing. It's just the way it is. I mean, the the plenary power argument is just it's it's basically a dead letter if you follow the Supreme Court precedents of the last 15 years. So I, I don't know why they wasted their time with that. They would have been better off trying to argue why this is OK. And, you know, if they have to rely on court mods, should rely on it unless, you know, <laughs> maybe we can get... We'll see right. who uh, embraces Korematsu. And to this point, I don't know, in Trump's life, to the extent that Trump drove this at all, which I don't think he really did. I mean, he wanted this, obviously, but in terms of driving it and saying we need to set it down on paper and sign it as an executive order, that seems like a Miller-Bannon thing. Bannon probably having a passing familiarity with the fact that there are executive orders and it uh, they don't – I don't – can't quite understand them, but you can do magical things with them. Miller would have a better understanding, probably. Uh, but Trump just, you know, what do I have to do to get what I want out of this? Uh, th- and this is another, the, the thrust of, I guess, of the, what will make the second article of the show here. And if you if you want to hang in and listen to this, you certainly can. Hey, I, I'm sorry. I, that's I, drove no you all, I drove you off a cliff with this. It's no, just... no, this was a, a necessary inquiry. I knew this one would take up a lot of time. I thought it was a great article. And a great, great food for thought that Ian gave us. And I, I really wanted to have your take on 
so, something you, well, you wouldn't have read in the right, papers about the Ninth Circuit. I don't think circuit. it's a legal argument as much as it is a practical argument that Trump completely undermines himself by displaying his unfitness, his ignorance, yes. his, his inability to do the work. But to the uh, extent that it's a legal argument at all, it's the the the, the key takeaway from Ian is uh, you need to familiarize yourself with the extent to which our law incorporates the president's real use of discretion as the impetus for executive action. It's all, it's almost everywhere in the law as powers of the federal government at large and the executive branch in particular have expanded dramatically since, you know, since World War II, but then I think even uh, geometrically with 9-11, the president's discretion is everywhere in the law and it's been put there it's a shortcut it's a it's a cop out but it's a cop out that the congress has been confident in leaning on because there's never yet <clears throat> never yet been a president who doesn't believe in doing the background thinking required to truly exercise anything that an english speaker would call discretion that's right. never been an issue before. <clears throat> yeah, right. And listen, the, the concept, of course, is uh, we're, we're talking about this in the context of Trump's incompetence. And I think, you know, that's the main reason that, that Ian is, is identifying. But, you know, in the uh, DAPA case out of Texas in the Fifth Circuit where uh, President Obama's exercise of discretion, which is also – very much something that should have been deferred to. Uh, both the district court and the Fifth Circuit decided, "Hey, we don't care mm. that you're president. We're gonna That's we're gonna you. second guess your prosecutorial discretion." Yeah, and, and, and it really was. There was no constitutional uh, principles involved. This was, "Hey, you're not following the law. You know what?" Trump's not following the Monuments Clause. Can we create some bullshit standing? Oops, yeah. BS standing. People know about uh, that one. <laughs> uh, to, uh, to 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 be able to to find it. Well, that's what we're asking a court in New York to do. In some respects, uh, on the Foreign Monuments Clause, I actually think, as I've said on this show, that there's a much better argument for standing on some of these domestic Monuments Clauses issues. Yeah. But you know, everyone's like, "Oh, you got to respect the president's discretion." Well, you know, they didn't dis uh, respect it, and they were cheering back then. So it's always whose ox is being gored. I mean, that's just the way the courts work. Yeah, people who okay. who deny that, you know, I mean, on both sides, our guys aren't the principled ones, and they and they and those are the hacks. They're all, if you want to call that being a hack, they're hacks. Yeah, the Supreme Court is a political body. That's what it is. People need to understand that. And frankly, that's why this, you know, not coming to vote because God knows what. You didn't like Hillary's Goldman Sachs speeches. It's just mm. indefensible. I mean, but anyway, yes. uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let you go to your second article and right, I'll listen. Yeah. And if I have something to say about that one, <laughs> I'll call back in. All right. Sure. Thanks for your time there, Armando. Thank, thanks for letting me All right. go on on that. No problem. It really, I, I think we, uh, I think we added a lot to, uh, to the discussion today, focusing on probably an article that will get considerably less attention than the others. I mean, there's the top news stuff, and to be sure, just I guess to assure you that I have seen it. Yes, I, for instance, know about, uh, uh, well, just to make note of it, since, uh, Armando did just bring it up, the story in Politico, Isaac Arnsdorf's piece, Saudis foot the tab at Trump Hotel. He was shopping this one around correctly last night on Twitter as the first proof of a foreign emolument being uh, granted, let's say, to President Trump. Uh, long story short here, they tried to launder this thing, but basically the government of Saudi Arabia threw a a government relations slash lobbying slash communications outfit that they employ here in Washington, D.C., Corvus MSL Group. And Corvus, I know from advertising days, they used to do just straight-up product advertising as well as other sorts of 
corporate communications, and they've expanded to include this in Saudi Arabia as a client. Basically, the Saudi government, you know, uh, took out, you know, took up uh, hotel rooms in the D.C. Trump International Hotel, and sort of, kind of tried to launder the payments instead of the government of Saudi Arabia reserving the rooms. And, and I don't think it was even a tremendous block of rooms. I'm not even sure how much money was involved. But they asked Corvus to book the rooms. And this is a weird thing. The, the, the purpose of which was Corvus was asked to organize veterans in, and other activists in this country, according to the political piece, to come to Washington to urge Congress. This is the kicker. Why veterans would do this? to urge Congress to repeal the law letting 9-11 victims and their families, rather, sue Saudi Arabia. An enormous political issue uh, that that played off back and forth. You may remember that, uh, actually, this is something that Adam uh, Adam Bonin has been active in. He's, he's among the clients pushing for this law. And it was an enormous battle to get it passed. And it was passed by the Congress and, in fact, vetoed by President Obama. And then they overrode his veto to pass this law. And now, interestingly, so Corvus was bringing in veterans to try to lobby to repeal this law, which you'd think would be a tall order given that it had passed by two-thirds in both houses just in the last Congress. But anyway, those veterans that were going to come in were going to stay at the Trump International Hotel, and Corvus was going to foot the bill, but they were, of course, going to bill Saudi Arabia for them as their client. Uh, so whatever. January, one of the vet, it says here in the article, one of the veterans checked in on January 23rd, left January 26th at the rate of 250 to $325 a night plus tax. So it wasn't even renting the grand $10,000 a night suite or anything like that. But the point is, they've now done it, and as much as they tried to disguise it, the Saudis said, uh, let's use our government money and put it in Trump's pockets indirectly. It's not a huge, huge thing, but at least it triggers that now we see that this is actually happening. And of course, you'll remember that way back when, what, two, three, I don't know how many weeks ago, four weeks ago, just before inauguration, that Trump said, uh, well, uh, I'm going to get around the emoluments clause on this one. Any time a foreign government pays the bill at the Trump D.C. hotel, I'll give the money to the Treasury. So start the clock, everybody. And I guess we have some idea of what kind of check we should be getting, too. So we'll want to see that one held up on camera uh, and signed just like he's showing all of his executive orders, please. And the sooner the better. The Treasury could use the 325 bucks or whatever. Anyway, also interesting that they tried to launder it through a intermediary. But that's I just wanted to you know point out that I know that's on the record. Uh, not where we're going to spend our time. Also, for the record, um, now that uh, Sessions is attorney general that created the vacancy for the Senate in Alabama and the the replacement is the, uh, well, uh, uh, the former attorney general of Alabama, Luther Strange, has been appointed by the governor of Alabama to come and fill Sessions' seat. Don't know much about Luther Strange other than the funny name, except that, as it happens, as uh, David Neer writes up for Daily Coast, uh, the Alabama governor taps the attorney general to fill this Senate vacancy, who may or may not be already investigating the governor. So the governor may have done himself a tremendous favor, or, or I guess if Luther Strange is a man of incredible integrity, uh, maybe sunk himself, but I, I think he's probably helped himself. Kicked the attorney general upstairs, as they say, sent him to the Senate, and uh, we'll see <clears throat> what happens with respect to the investigation of the governor. Anyway, I just want to put that one on the record. Uh, also, last night they voted to confirm Price to HHS and immediately in, voted to, I guess, I, I'm sure that it carried, I didn't even check this morning, invoke closure on the Mnuchin nomination for treasury which uh will trigger the 30 hour clock and keep them here into saturday so thank your democratic senators for fighting as hard as they can i know rebecca reminded us this morning that this is more bad news but i wanted to point out that they really are doing everything that they can to slow walk this and it's not that it does so much to make it take 
two, three, four days to install a cabinet secretary who was going to be installed anyway, inevitably. You might wonder why we would do that. Reminder, the longer that the Senate must occupy all of its time, and literally all of its time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to get these things done at three to four nominations per week, is... The longer they have to deal with this, the less time there is and the longer they have to wait to get the disastrous policy proposals to the floor and have those battles. There's just going to be less time in this Congress to do the terrible stuff that they want to try to do. And remember, the the cabinet is not the end of this process. If Democrats wanted to do it, and they're by the way, they're going to come under tremendous pressure not to continue doing this from the Republicans, of course, but from the punditry, who are going to increasingly be towing the line that Republicans are feeding them, that this is unprecedented obstructionism, and it is, or that uh, other presidents have had their selections, their cabinets filled in X amount of time, and that's disputable because there were certainly other cabinet members from previous presidents that took longer to put in place. But is this the slowest pace of any modern president? Yeah, it is, and you're welcome for that. We're just following ye old rules. And by the way, under the old rules, before Democrats changed them, you wouldn't have hardly any of these uh, cabinet appointments in place. You'd still be empty. You'd still be minus price. You'd still be minus uh, everybody else. Sessions, certainly. They just would have been filibustered, period. So the fact that you have what you have is thanks to us. You know, I'm not particularly happy about having helped you, but I helped you. Because I love the country so much. You're the ones that would have, you know, you showed everybody what you There's no, everyone knows the point of Merrick Garland. He's not on the court because that's the way it used to be for all of these appointments. At least you have a cabinet. But the cabinet is not the end of this. Uh, once they have all those department heads there, remember, there's still hundreds, up to a thousand positions that require exactly the same procedure, but which we don't think about or know much about because ordinarily the Congress simply says, I don't care about the, you want them, you got them. These people are not important policy people. Some of them are important policy people, but they just pretend that they're not. And some of them are not. And they just, as they say, unblock altogether, uh, unanimously consent to lists of hundreds of names, hundreds of names to get approved. By the way, even military promotions can be slow walked this way if you want to. That's a dangerous thing to do. And I don't know that I would recommend it, although it might be interesting if there's a really weird or egregious case, if there's really something to examine here, just to demonstrate that that could be done, but it's probably better politically to get out of the way of military promotions. But they require, in many cases, congressional approval as well. But certainly, thousand, a thousand plus is the, the, the usual count of how many positions could be slow walk. Can you imagine doing these four at a time? It would mean the uh this congress would come to an end the two year terms would come we'd be in the 2018 elections over and done with before they got to their first piece of legislation now, occasionally they'll have to interrupt the nominations to deal with budget issues and appropriations issues and they'll probably sneak a few things in in between there too even ones that are controversial but you could literally occupy the entire congress simply by saying you want them you can have them there's no filibuster to worry about. It's just going to take you time. You're going to have to file for cloture, wait for the cloture motion to ripen, vote for cloture, run the 30-hour clock, and you just physically can't do more than four of them per week. And how long can you even do that? People are getting exhausted. Plenty of articles about that. I'll give you some to read, but that would mean uh, if I read them to you now, we wouldn't get to this. The second of the articles that I actually wanted to spend some time on, also from Politico, Alex Eisenstadt, Kenneth Vogel, Josh Dawsey. This one you knew I had to take a look at. You've probably read it already, too. Trump vexed by challenges, comma, scale of government. The new president's allies say he has been surprised, believe it or not, that government can't be run like his business. 
Wah, wah. Do I have a sad trombone thing? To I think I actually do. Hmm, uh, searching around. This is not immediately apparent. There we are. Ooh, that hurts my ears, that one. I should have that one re-recorded at some point. Okay. I think I actually have a trombone around here somewhere, too. I don't know if I can play it. Anyway, uh, yeah, government can't be run like a business. Now, that's a big issue for us. We've mentioned that before. But uh, I was I was pleased by seeing the political writers here referring to Trump's business in what I think is the correct mode as having run his experience being, I've run a family business. This is, there's a lot of money involved in the family business, no doubt about it. And it's larger than most family businesses. But again, never ran a fortune 500 con- company, never ran anything like the giant bureaucracy involved in a huge international corporation. Does he have international interests? Yes. Is he a corporation? Yeah. Does he manage a lot of properties or have a lot of deals going? Yes, sure. Are there, is there more money involved in it than most family businesses? Yes. But it's important to note, family business. In other words, he's not responsible even to a board of directors other than his family. He never has to take anybody else's interests or thoughts, for that matter, into consideration. And that's enormously important. Also enormously important, he's an idiot, and why he thought he would be able to do this, I'll never have any idea, except that we know he's an egomaniac. Nobody should ever think that they can do this job, period, really. But And you have to be an egomaniac to think you can. But then there's competent egomaniacs and people who understand government, and sometimes that overlaps, and there's incompetent idiots and people who don't understand government and, and... that's what you don't want at the head of the... Okay, so let me read their, their piece here because I think it makes the point uh, certainly more coherently than I'm making. And I think it's great to read it alongside Ian's piece here, remembering, keeping in mind that the premise uh, that really matters, I think, from Ian's piece is an enormous amount of what the government does and under the the authority under which it does it rests on the assumption that the president in exercising what we call discretion will undertake a real deliberative process uh, that delivers due process to the citizens and uh, other members of the community who are affected by the decisions, and that it's going to be, even if it's the wrong decision, a reasoned decision. And this article calls into question his ability to make reasoned decisions of any kind, much less the weighty kind that the government, the head of government, would be uh, called upon to, to, to make. So I think it makes a great reading companion, but uh, you wouldn't know that because I haven't read it yet. Being president, it begins, is harder than Donald Trump thought according to aides and allies who say he's growing increasingly frustrated with the challenges of running the massive federal bureaucracy. Now, uh, even that can be just like throwaway Republican rhetoric. Well, I'm frustrated by the massive federal bureaucracy. Yes, we're all frustrated by that, etc. But uh, this is more along the lines of brass tack stuff. He can't make it work even if he understood it, even if it was explained to him. He doesn't have the patience or the mental capacity to do it he's never been tested like this yes he runs a lot of things but what he says goes in his thing and as we discussed more at length yesterday he what he's most adept at is disguising the disastrous results of his idiotic impulsive decision making everybody thinks he's a big success as a businessman because he's got the trappings But he is tap dancing as fast as he can to maintain the trappings. And the trappings are mostly spray painted gold to begin with. All right, back to the article. In interviews, nearly two dozen people who've spent time with Trump in the three weeks since his inauguration said that his mood has careened, which is bad news, period, between surprise and anger. It's bad news if your mood careens as president. If it careens between workaholic euphoria and something horrible that's bad but at least occasionally you'll be in workaholic euphoria he's careening between uh surprise and anger 
<laughs> which are two highly unproductive modes of operation. So he's careening between surprise and anger as he faced the predictable realities of governing. And all of this was predictable, too, by the way. From congressional delays over his cabinet nominations and legal fights holding up his aggressive initiatives to staff infighting and leaks. The administration's rocky opening days have been a setback for a president who, as a billionaire businessman, maybe, sold himself to voters as being uniquely qualified to fix what ailed the nation. So it's much more than his incompetence. This should also be the death knell of, we need a businessman, but uh, we've seen how Republicans deal with this in the past. We need a conservative, a small government conservative, to really rein things in and bring us back to the original intent of the founders. Okay, we'll elect the guy that you recommend. Uh, he screws that up. Horrible things ensue. Well... He wasn't a real conservative, right? So now, well, he wasn't a real businessman. It's not hard to get out from underneath. It's just embarrassing for the time being. Fine. Yet it has become apparent, say those close to the president, most of whom requested anonymity to describe the inner workings of the White House, that the transition from overseeing a family business, ding, to running the country has been tough on him. And yeah, it, I, I'll, I'll say it again. It will kill him if he tries. Trump often asks simple questions about policies, proposals, and personnel. We heard just the other day the thing that shocked the hell out of me. Although not a surprise, just again shocking to see it happening. Right, just like the other day, uh, we heard that when he was speaking to Angela Merkel, who I, I think uh, Saturday Night Live tells me that she pronounces the name Angela, and I'll believe that. Uh, that the in the simple phone call, she had to explain to him what the Geneva Conventions were. I almost forgot about that until I was reminded that the other day, word comes out that he's on the phone again with Putin and talking uh, strategic missile issues, uh, nuclear weapons issues, and uh, uh, pearl, uh, and, and and weapons control issues. Uh, has to ask, has to pause the conversation. What's this? What's the new START treaty? What's START? Remember, by the way, that back in the eighties, when uh, we were reminded by this uh, of this during the campaign, that at one point in the eighties, Trump got the idea in his head that he should be the one negotiating strategic missile reduction talks with the Soviets, and that uh, what do you need to know? I need an hour, hour and a half to know all there is to know about missiles, and I think I probably know it all anyway. That was his actual legitimate, he really did make that statement. The Mr. I already know all there is to know about missiles. Oh, P.S., what's the START treaty? What? What? Shocking. But not the thrust of this article. But Trump does often ask simple questions about policies, proposals, and personnel. When discussions get bogged down in details, the president has been known to quickly change the subject. Why? To seem in control at all times, one senior government official said, or to direct questions about details to his chief strategist, Steve Bannon, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, oh, or House Speaker Paul Ryan. What in the world is he directing? I don't know. I mean, maybe it's a maybe about legislative issues, possibly, but I've never. I don't really recall another president ever thinking that the person to defer or run-of-the-mill questions to is the Speaker of the House. He's not on your team, man. I mean, you guys are both Republicans, but all right, whatever. Maybe it was legislative stuff. Trump has privately expressed disbelief over the ability of judges, bureaucrats, or lawmakers to delay or even stop him from fi filling positions and implementing policies. Like He's genuinely stunned, as I think we all found out through his tweets, that judges could do what they do. He's not used to that. He's used to be, uh, being involved in civil litigation where they're very careful about, you know, making sure every, each side gets a chance to, you know, answer the other and blah, blah, blah. And he usually is able to steamroller people in court, uh, and his lawyers are superior to those who, uh, end up suing him and he usually gets his way. But, uh, well, lately he hasn't been getting his way in the fraud things because that's a slightly different context. But yeah, uh, constitutional law. You can't just, you know, be a big, you know, rogue elephant in con law. It doesn't work. They're used to dealing with the biggest rogue elephant there is. 
and you're not even good at being the presidential rogue elephant. And he's just surprised. You mean, how come it takes so long? Why don't they? I mean, like he's never heard of the filibuster or anything, nothing. And that isn't even what's going on. But he just has no idea. He just doesn't watch these things. He's not a government guy. After Trump grew infuriated by disclosures of his confrontational phone calls with foreign leaders, an investigation was launched into the source of the leaks. According to one White House aide, National Security Council staffers have been instructed to cooperate with inquiries, including requests to inspect their electronic communications, said two sources familiar with the situation. It's not clear whether the investigation is a formal proceeding or how far along it is or who's conducting it. That's sort of beside the point, but it's an interesting one. Uh, and, and here, I guess we'll just toss in this one, our, another of our poor snowflake comments. Interesting that now uh, that he's the subject of the leaks, leaks are outrageous again. Hmm. The administration is considering limiting the universe of aides with access to the calls or their transcripts, said one administration official, adding that the leaks and Trump's anger over them has created a climate where people are very careful who they talk to, which really ought to be the case anyway. So I'm not too worried about that. The president and his allies believe career NSC staff assigned from other agencies are out to get them. In turn, some NSC staff believe Trump does not possess the capacity for detail and nuance required to handle the sensitive issues discussed on the calls and that he has politicized their agency by appointing Chief Strategist Bannon to the council. All true, and by the way, to the extent that it is true that career NSC staff assigned from other agencies are there to get him, they are out to get him, well, one, so much the better, and two, you can keep them on the job longer the longer it takes the Senate to fill the NSC and the other agencies with the staffers he intends to be in those positions. And that can take a very long time. And you need to let your Democratic senators know that you insist that they continue. Because once we get past the cabinet positions, there will be, like I said, both enormous pressure from both Republicans and the punditry and the D.C. establishment to simply say, okay, you've done your showboating, now get out of the way and let's approve 25 of these sub-cabinet level positions at a time or a 100 or more, let's catch up on things. And it's something, it's leverage to deal with, and occasionally you might find it worth making a deal in exchange for something really, really good. But for the most part, the default position should be cloture votes and 30 hours for every position that requires Senate approval, no matter what it is or who they are. It's not a question of whether or not the person is qualified, although that is sometimes good justification if you need it for comfort. But the point isn't necessarily that everybody needs that much examination, but rather that this is something the Senate can do and we will do it so that you can't do anything else. And that in the meantime, those NSC staffers on assignment from other agencies who might be undermining this idiot president who could get us all killed will have to stay on the job. I'm okay with that. Tell your senators, make a big deal out of everything. Last week, Trump told an associate he had become weary of infighting among and leaks from his White House staff because it reflects on me, because it's all about him, and that he intended to sit down staffers and tell them to cut this S word out. Oh, my. <gasps> okay, President's curse. Although he swears that he doesn't, right? Yeah. So don't worry, it's just locker room talk. He also became aggravated after learning about complications surrounding his appointment of one of his top fundraisers, Anthony Scaramucci, to a plum White House job, which Trump blamed on internal jockeying between aides, according to one person with knowledge of the situation. Trump was furious, this person says. He doesn't like this S. Lots of S being flung around today. The White House press office did not respond to a series of detailed questions about the way the president has coped with leaks, infighting, and setbacks. Christopher Ruddy, a Trump friend and the chief executive of the conservative Newsmax media, no wonder he's hanging around, right, said running the federal government is something new for him, for sure. But, Ruddy added, I think if he's demonstrated anything in his life, he's a very fast learner and adapts very quickly. This man is not to be underestimated. Yeah, I'm going to underestimate him. 
For all his frustrations, Trump has reveled in the trappings of the presidency. Ah, now something he's into, right? Curtains, window treatments. He has taken a liking to the Oval Office, where he spends much of his time working. Following a recent gathering of business leaders, he brought the group into the storied room and showed them around. But he has also sought refuge from the pressures of the presidency, frequently calling up old friends and sounding them out about golf. Remember when that was a huge point with him? Oh my God, Obama plays golf too much. Trump aides joked that they wish their boss would spend more time at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida, where they say the president appears more relaxed and at ease. How can you tell? He dispensed hugs and kisses to female guests attending a Red Cross ball at the estate last week, and he is scheduled to return this weekend for a round of golf with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. <gasps> another one? Yes, another multi-million dollar vacation in his third week. For the second time, he is taking a multi-million dollar golfing vacation and hugging and kissing whoever the lady, whatever ladies show up at Mar-a-Lago. Still per lago everybody. Most of those interviewed for this story requested anonymity to describe the inner workings of a White House where they say the tension has been intensified by the president's propensity for knee-jerk micromanaging when faced with disappointment and jockeying among aides to avoid blame or claim credit when possible. The interview paints a picture of the interviews paint a picture of a powder keg of a workplace where job duties are unclear Morale among some is low, factionalism is rampant, and exhaustion is running high. Two visitors to the White House last week said they were struck by how tired the staff looks. Again, it's going to kill this president. In Washington circles, talk has turned to whether a staff shakeup is in the works. Three weeks. Three weeks. One person close to Trump said, I think he'd like to do it now, but he knows it's too soon. Those closest to the president are unnerved by that prospect, which they say would be a tacit acknowledgement that their team is struggling. Now, I'm not going to be able to get all the way through this, and I knew it when I delayed, and really, frankly, when I stopped to entertain Armando's talk, but I thought that was much more important than actually finishing up this article, but I wanted to give you a flavor of what was going on. Likely you had already heard about it. And the rest of this stuff, as entertaining as stories are about how Sean Spicer is losing his marbles and people are stabbing one another in the back, the real point I wanted to make in bringing this up was that in combination, this story about his incompetence to the task, the shortness of his temper, the the inadequacies of the counsel he's getting from his band of lunatics, combined with what Ian Milheiser reminded us about, how much discretion is granted to the president and what discretion is really supposed to mean and how it will just probably never be the case that he'll be able to exercise what, like I said, English speakers would refer to as discretion. That's the enormity of the problem. That's the reason this guy has to be bounced from office as soon as possible. I just wanted to give you that to think about over the weekend. There's plenty more, of course, and when it comes to news stories that you'll need to know for the weekend, the after show will catch you up. Democracy, they say, is impossible without the institutions that are meant to expose lies. Institutions such as universities, the media, and the judiciary, that's why Trump is determined to destroy them. And maybe he misheard Morning Joe, but Trump is now criticizing the money allocated for the U.S. air traffic control system to keep planes from crashing. What else? Plenty more coming up. I'll tell you a little bit more after this. From Daily Coves Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Still to come on the after show, neo-Nazis, Klansmen, and other white nationalists are absolutely giddy. Trump has finally buried Lee Atwater because who needs a dog whistle anymore when their guy has a bullhorn puppet? Also, Trump's new vague executive order won't make cops safer, but it might make a felony to yell at them. Just what we need. Stay tuned.